Hello, I'm a grad student given the easy task of answering the question, what is rhetoric? In this video, I will impart to you all knowledge of rhetoric since the beginning of time in 5 to 10 minutes. In the beginning, a dude named Plato stood around philosophizing about communication in ancient Greece. Some people said they saw a chair, but Plato said he stood in a cave and only saw the shadow of the chair. He said we use language to describe this shadow to somehow get a better concept of the chair. Other people said, hey Plato, come out of that cave. He said, no. So they went into the cave with him and became his students. Another group called Sophists refused to go into the cave because they said reality was purely subjective and truth was just a tool used to persuade others. Question: How do perceptions of truth, authenticity, and rationality affect your communication? Do you really know who your audience is, or are you just imagining them? Are you writing for no one, anyone, or everyone? Think about it. Around the same time as Plato, somewhere in the ancient world, a man named Aristotle referred to three core concepts of rhetoric that we now call the rhetorical triangle. The triangle consists of the author, the message, and the audience. These parts of the triangle correspond with three appeals you can use in an argument. You can use ethos, pathos, and logos. These appeals exist inside of a context. The ancient Greeks also talked about kairos. Kairos means opportune moment. Kairotic moments are a good time to make an argument. Situations which create opportunities for persuasion are also called exigencies. Question. Are these concepts always present in an argument? Do all of these strategies need to be used to persuade someone? What is the definition of persuasion? Think about it. Later in Rome, an antagonistic cat named Cicero organized the five canons of rhetoric. The first is invention. Remember our buddy Aristotle? He described topics of invention called topoi. His topics were definition, comparison, cause and effect, and circumstance. With these in mind, how are you going to effectively maximize persuasion? Arrangement. How do you structure your argument to be the most effective? Classic rhetoricians said the proper structure was something like this. Introduction, statement of facts, division, proof, refutation, and conclusion. Style. The audience will have a hard time buying your argument if you deliver the message in a form inconsistent with the subject and the audience. How do you present the message in a persuasive way? Memory. Originally this referred to memorizing the speech, but memory also refers to the subject matter as a whole and the memory of the audience. What quotes, sources, and backup material can you use to persuade the audience? How do you make your message memorable? Delivery how you deliver the message. At the time, it was referring to public speaking, but today delivery also refers to the format of the message. What device or technology is being used, if any at all? Question. How does your chosen medium, expression, and creativity make your message more or less persuasive? Think about it. Later in Rome, an awesome public figure named Quintilian came along, and some of his ideas would later be called stasis theory. By later, I mean several hundred years. Now, the stasis theory model is used quite often in law. Thanks, Quintilian! The stasis theory model can also be represented as a triangle, this time with four tiers. Each one from the bottom up must be completed for a truly persuasive argument. The bottom tier is fact. What are the facts of X? The second is definition. What is the definition of X? The third is the quality. What is the value of X? The last is the policy. What should be done about X? Question. How does your authorship, authority, and power affect your rhetoric? Think about it. In the 1950s, a British gentleman named Toulmin came up with another idea. But first, I need to explain the syllogism. In classic Aristotelian models, a syllogism looked like this. A. People that eat uncooked noodles are weird. B. Josh likes to eat uncooked noodles. C. Therefore, Josh is weird. To convert this to a Toolman model, C is the claim, Josh is weird. B is the evidence, Josh likes to eat uncooked noodles. A is the warrant, people that eat uncooked noodles are weird. This is the unspoken part of the argument that the author and the audience should both agree upon. So the Toolman argument would look like this. Josh is weird because he likes to eat uncooked noodles. According to Toolman, if your audience does not buy your warrant, they are not going to be persuaded. The concept of a warrant brings many ideas, including shared bodies of knowledge, culture, experience, and intertextuality. I would like to introduce the key word semiotics, or how we interpret signs and symbols. The Toolman model and semiotics can be used to analyze visual and digital rhetoric in society today. Question. How does the interconnectivity of knowledge affect your message? 
How do analogy, metaphor, symbolism, and significance influence persuasion? Think about it. In 1970, some guys named Young, Becker, and Pike got together and developed Rogerian argumentation based upon the ideas of an American psychologist named Carl Ransom Rogers. The idea is you need to understand the opposing arguments to make a good argument yourself. To do this, describe a problem, describe the context in which alternative positions may be valid, state your position and a circumstance in which it would be valid, explain to the opposition how your position would be beneficial to them. Question. What is the experience of your audience and how will they interact with your message? How does your perceived identity and your audience's identity change effective persuasion techniques? Think about it. In my infinite understanding and wisdom, I have decided to end this video by asking questions about modern rhetoric instead of attempting to provide answers. In the modern day, technology has changed our ability to use chaotic moments in our writing. How does the technology we use affect methods of persuasion? Anonymity when communicating is a serious issue these days. How does the publicness or privateness of your message affect your rhetoric? How do others perceive their anonymity when composing and how does that influence their message? Who is using your message and what are they doing to interpret your message? How do symbols, grammar, and conventions affect your rhetoric? Now that you are thoroughly confused, it is time for me to go. This video was brought to you by the letter R, the number 469 BC, and the color gray. Thanks for watching.